Well, good evening and welcome to Copernic Observatory. Great to have a full house, soon to be overflowing house. Uh, my name is Drew Desker. I'm the director here. Uh, it's great to see some very familiar faces, but especially great to see some new faces here. Uh, just by show of hands, who's here for the first time? Wow, great, great. Well, um, you definitely picked a, a superb night to, uh, to come up uh, for a Copernic program. A show of hands, who here is a member? Okay, I was going to say almost the, the other half there. Uh, so, um, the people that raise their hand second have a, a particularly valuable piece of information that, uh, that they utilize, and that's uh, the, the value of a Copernic membership. So, Copernic is a, a nonprofit, we're a 501c3, um, and uh, we do everything we can to make the most of every dollar that comes in. Um, and a membership is, is, is one of the things that sort of helps keep our doors open um, and keep our employees employed. Um, but we belong to a, uh, an organization called the ASTC, the Association of Science and Technology Centers. And uh, so a Copernic membership gets you into not only here at Copernic on any Friday night, but also will get you into over 350 other science centers. So if you like this kind of a place, uh, a Copernic membership, like a fa family membership here is uh, $75. Uh, and you almost can't find uh, another science center with a, with a year-long family membership at, you know, at that price. Um, and so literally you can go to, you can go to Robeson, you can go to the Ithaca Science Center, you can go to the Museum of Science and Technology up in Syracuse, uh, the Franklin Institute down in, in Philly, or the Intrepid. In fact, actually uh, one of our members was just down at the Intrepid uh, uh, earlier this week, or last Sunday, and basically, here, why don't you, you're going to have a testimonial right here. Yeah, World II of Vietnam era aircraft carrier parked in the Hudson off, you know, Manhattan. And there's a whole bunch of planes in that area and helicopters on the deck. There's one of the original space shuttle is there you can walk around. There's a submarine you can get into. And uh, there's a Gemini capsule, a Mercury capsule. It's just the coolest thing. It costs 36 bucks, 34 if you're a senior, 18 if you're a resident of New York City. Well, my, my daughter and I went. I showed him my card. I got it. I got in. So it was less 34 and 18. That's 52 bucks that I didn't have to pay. That's more than the membership costs. Okay. And if if we both paid full retail, it would be 70 dollars. So, you know, it, it's real. <laughs> So, um, but anyway, uh, it, so always uh, trying to uh, make people aware of, of what a Copernic membership can do. Um, but again, if you go to our website, um, we'll tell you about what's going on. So always at the top of the screen, it's uh, the next uh, event coming up. So we have a, uh, our Summer Skies event is, uh, is tonight. But also we have uh, uh, other programs that we have going on. We have, uh, uh, well, I think your public classes. So we have our summer camps. So. Uh, we are now, this is our 31st year of what they call the Link Summer STEM Exploration Camps. And uh, these are camps for students that are as young, uh, just finishing up first grade through high school. Um, although I will say that pretty much all of our elementary school cl uh, camps are, are, are full. Uh, we do have some uh, openings in our middle and high school, uh, high school camps. And so uh, if you're uh, looking for uh, an engaging, uh, fun uh, time this summer, uh, definitely want to check that out. Also, if any of you are high school students and might be interested in uh, interning, we are looking for interns to help us out uh, during the summer. So uh, um, you can hit me afterwards, uh, or you can go to our website, and there's actually a place where you can, uh, under visitor info, uh, under well, I'm trying to think where is it? Under oh, it's under support, volunteer. So there's another place that you could uh, uh, check out and um, and look for. Um, an opportunity to engage here at Copernic. Copernic is really all about, um, you know, expanding our knowledge and not just always about astronomy. Uh, so that's what these Friday night programs are, are about. Although, you know, full, dis full disclosure, tonight's program isn't about astronomy, <laughs> but uh, the rest of the time, uh, we really have an you know have an opportunity to learn about a wide range of topics. Um, uh, a few weeks ago, we had somebody that talks about the research she's doing. Uh, in deep sea drilling uh, and looking at fossils and tectonic uh, uh, movements from that. Uh, we've had uh, somebody here talking about the physics of music. Why does a violin, an oboe, and a trumpet all sound different? 
playing the same note. Um, and uh, so we, we've been doing this, these Friday night programs for a very long time. Back in, in 2020, in March of 2020, um, we had to start, we had to shut down Copernic because of the COVID and uh, including our Friday night programs. And we said, all right, we'll just wait a couple of weeks for this thing to blow over. And um, well, that didn't exactly play out. And so uh, uh, by May, we said, look, we've got all these speakers lined up. Why don't we just continue engaging the public? So we had the speakers zoom into us. We then turned that back around and put it out on our YouTube live stream. We now have over 13,000 subscribers. Uh, and uh, every one of our Friday night programs is on our, uh, on our YouTube channel, which actually you can find here. It's, uh, it's easy to find. You just go into YouTube and just type in Copernic Observatory. And what's great about it is not only can you watch the programs live, but then uh, if you miss a program or if you want to review a program that you saw live, you can just go back and look at those programs that we did. So uh, um, last week we had, uh, we were talking about Neptune. The weekend before that was a high school robotics team. Um, here's that talk about tiny fossils can, uh, uh, can answer large questions about our Earth systems. Um, we talked about the Marconi Tower that uh, exists down here in Binghamton. So um, a number of really just great programs that uh, you can go back and see. But beyond that, we also have had a number of live streams where, uh, like actually about a year ago, there was a, a lunar eclipse, if, if anybody recalls. And um, at one point, we had over 25,000 people on our YouTube channel watching our, our live stream, actually watching Jeremy, our live stream astronomer. So. Um, this has been uh, what, what turned out to be a uh, sort of a well. Let's just do something. Has turned into a real uh, opportunity for us to to really expand our outreach, and we often will get people on our live stream that are, are watching from Manila or Australia. In fact, it's usually somebody from Australia every um, Saturday morning is is, is a, or Saturday afternoon is watching our, our live streams. So again, every Friday night, we try to do something here uh, to expand our knowledge and. Um, Tonight is a perfect night for this talk, uh, uh, and, and a perfect person to do it. Jeremy uh, Cardi, actually, he started out as a as a co uh, as a high school intern, uh, continued to work through uh, co uh, uh, college with us, and is now an instructor, uh, uh, an educator here with us. Uh, very knowledgeable, and um, really is going to uh, open your eyes to uh, what what we can see in the skies tonight. Um, and I won't no spoilers. I'm just going to hand the mic over to to uh, Jeremy and let you do it. Let's see, there he goes. Thanks, Drew. All right, yeah. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, like Drew said, it is probably among the most perfect nights for a talk like this. Uh, it's rare that these things align. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm excited to share with you what we're going to be able to, some of what we'll see tonight. We're in you know, late spring now. Um, but uh, this, is, this program is really for what's, we're, what we're going to see going into the summer. Uh, but it'll be a little bit of a, a, a mix. So uh, let's just get right into it here. I'll bring this full screen. So yeah, what's in the night sky this summer? So the things we're going to discuss today, we, uh, I always like to go through um, the ABCs of stargazing, uh, as, just as an introduction to how you can navigate the night sky. What are the things that you should look for? Uh, so. It's a, a, just a cursory look at, at astronomy, um, giving you those tools. Then we'll talk about what you can actually see. Some of the things that we can discuss include the International Space Station, which is really very relevant for tonight. In fact, uh, I don't think it could be more perfect for at least how we set up our programs, the timing of it, and you'll see why. Uh, then uh, SpaceX Starlink. We'll talk about that. You can potentially spot SpaceX Starlink this summer. Um, we'll talk about what it is if you're unfamiliar. Uh, then solar system objects, the Milky Way, deep sky objects. There's a lot to spot this summer. So we'll get into all of that. Uh, and then I also have some observing tools that you can use. Um, some really accessible ones, I think, um, and even some free resources uh, for you to use at home. So yeah, let's get started here with those ABCs of stargazing. And if you've attended one of our sky programs in the past. This is going to be reiterating the same thing, but I, I like to make sure we accommodate any newcomers to Copernic as well, so it'll be review for you. Uh, so 
when we go, we're just going to go through ABC. A is for angular size and distance. So the best tool you have on you to help measure this is your hand. Your hand at arm's length in particular, uh, viewed up towards the sky. So you see here, a little bit blurry I know, but um, I can point out each, what each of these measures are. When you hold your pinky out at arm's length, the width of your pinky is about one degree. We'll get into the coordinates as well with the C's, in our ABC's. And uh, this is helping you measure degrees across the sky, degree, degrees between ang objects, so those angular measurements between objects, or altitude as well. You can measure from the ground up. So you're looking at Polaris. OK, I'm going to count up, um, maybe not using the pinky, but <laughs> uh, you're going to count up like 42 degrees uh, from the horizon. So pinky is one degree. Three fingers, arm's length, raising up towards the sky, you have five degrees. A fist, arm's length, is 10 degrees. Your index and pinky finger uh, is 15 degrees. Okay. And using those, you can measure distance between objects, like in the diagram here you see measuring the distance between uh, stars in the Big Dipper. Uh, but you can also do it between planets to a star. It's a great way to inform someone uh, that isn't as familiar with these objects, just using the tool you have with you at all times, how to find these, where exactly they are. Because one thing you're going to struggle with um, is pointing out objects. The only way that really works is if you're right close to each other. Um, Otherwise, you're going to be dealing with a ton of parallax. Now, to some degree, you can use uh, f you know, features of objects like brightness. So, OK, the brightest object in that area. OK, well, that's obviously the moon, right? The moon is the moon. V Venus that we'll see tonight. Venus is very bright, easy to spot. Uh, but what, things start to get more difficult when you're dealing with objects of similar brightness. Uh, so this is where that can come in handy. You just have them measure out. You can also combine this with a compass, just your compass directions. <clears throat> uh, and then the ideal, which is a tool that we will use tonight, is a green laser pointer, which is the best way to point out objects in the sky with someone unfamiliar. Um, so we'll be doing that tonight, too, and showing you how that works. But uh, this you have with you everywhere you go. All right, so handy sky measures <laughs> for our A. For B is for brightness, or in astronomy we call this magnitude. Now here's the scale of brightness. This is going to be, at a glance, very unintuitive. Take a look at that for a moment. We have this number line here. On the left, it's negative 25. On the right, positive 25. And I'm sure you've noticed at this point, negative numbers mean very bright positive numbers are very faint. So it's flipped. Uh, but you can see, just to give us some perspective on this, some objects that fall along this line, the sun is out there way towards negative 30, brightest objects in our skies. And then the moon falling in about negative 12 and a half or so, negative 13. Venus at around negative 4 at its brightest. Uh, Sirius is a negative, uh, we'll call that a negative two or so. Vega is right at that zero mark. Vega is a bright star that will be visible in the summertime. Uh, then you get to six and seven, positive six and seven, and that's the point where your eye will struggle to see that object. Now, in there too, you have a mix of light pollution. Um, Epic Copernic uh, will certainly have some light pollution to combat in the uh, northern sky as we look towards Vestal and Binghamton. Um, it's in our southern sky where it's the clearest and darkest. Uh, so looking at stars, you, you'll notice this tonight. You'll see the stars out there in the north. You'll see fewer of them. Looking to the south, there'll be a lot more. And that's light pollution at play. Um, so in the darkest conditions, you're going to be seeing objects with the naked eye at 6 or 7 magnitude. Um, those are ideal. Light pollution will knock that down a fair bit. 
and then everything else out there has to be access has to be telescopes, camera equipment. Um, that's the uh, equipment you need to capture faint objects like that. We're talking galaxies, um, some star clusters, nebulae, those deep sky objects out there in the universe. So that's uh, B is for brightness. Now we can also just do this uh, just by eye. I mean, just giving generalities, um, more the qualitative side of uh, viewing objects in the sky. Um, just saying, okay, you have the, the moon is the brightest object tonight, then you have Venus as the brightest point object in the sky. Uh, and you can scale down from there and just do it in local areas, like I was saying before. Um, in the northern sky, you'll have uh, the Big Dipper as one of the brighter constellations, for example. So those are ways you can point that out too. But this is the numerical scale for determining brightness, and we will see this in one of the applications we use to uh, look at the night sky. All right, so B is for brightness. C is for coordinates. And when you get into coordinates in astronomy, there are two systems we can use. One is from your frame of reference. So you're on the ground, we go outside into our field, you're on the ground looking up at the night sky, and you can point out objects using the altitude and azimuth coordinate system. So you can see here, on, that's on the left. And uh, we measure this against the compass directions for our azimuthal. Um, so you have north at zero degrees, east is 90 degrees, south 180, and west 270 degrees. So that's your starting point. Your origin on the azimuth is north zero degrees. And then you measure up across the sky in altitude. Zenith is at 90 degrees, and the horizon is at zero degrees. And then you combine those two to point out objects at that instance. Now, you could also, it will be generally true um, for over the course of an hour even. It won't move too, too much. But uh, as you sit there throughout the night stargazing, the sky will begin to shift as the Earth rotates. And uh, you'll see objects rise and set from east to west. So that system isn't perfect for, for uh, in fact, it's not ideal at all, for specific coordinates for objects in the sky. And uh, for a lot of um, telescopes that are astrographs, they're, they, they're designed to take pictures of the sky, like our 20-inch telescope. That's not the coordinate system you want that telescope to use. You want one that has specific coordinates for a given object in the sky. And that's where the system on the right comes from. That is our equatorial grid. And the equatorial grid is a projection of effectively the Earth's latitude and longitude. It's projected out from the equator. In fact, I have a great visual for this. Um, it's a type of globe. Okay, this is the celestial sphere, and you can see the Earth inside. And you can even spin the Earth. So, the Earth's North Pole in there is right at the top. South Pole comes down here at the bottom. And then the equator is projected out. So, where these two hemispheres meet, right here, that's the projection of the Earth's equator. And from there, you also have, effectively again, projections of the Earth's latitude and longitude, mapping out the sky. Now, what's important here is that this celestial grid, this equatorial grid, is not uh, linked to the Earth's rotation in the sense that it is mapped specifically to the celestial grid, the celestial sphere. So no matter where the celestial sphere goes, as, as the sky rotates, that grid stick keeps up with the stars. And that's why we can use it to pinpoint specific stars, specific nebulae. They have these different coordinates. In fact, the two coordinate systems, whereas before we had altitude and azimuth, with this one we have right ascension and declination. So declination is kind of like altitude. These are your, your uh, latitudinal lines coming up. That's declination. And then right ascension 
is going around kind of like your longitudinal lines. All right, so that is the celestial sphere. That is the projection from uh, the Earth. And that is one way that we can map out our uh, coordinates in the sky. A lot of telescopes use that. If they have an equatorial mount, they're going to use that grid. Um, and because it tracks these objects near perfect as they move across the sky, they're great for imaging. And that's, uh, in fact, all three of our domes use equatorial mounts rather than alt azimuth mounts. All right, so it's a little bit uh, technical on that front, especially with equatorial uh, grid. But the alt as is great for just standing outside and using uh, those, um, your, your hand extended out, the different methods. Pinky is one degree, right? Um, and pinpointing where those are. OK. So let's carry Oh, I can use my clicker, I think. There we go. So I do want to show you one of the tools we'll come back to a number of times. And I'm sure you might even get tired of hearing the, the word Stellarium. Um, but Stellarium is a fantastic tool, and it is free. So let's show you this. Back out of here. You go to Stellarium.org, and you can download it for free on Linux, Mac, Windows, or if you have a Chromebook, or even just a mobile device. They do have an application in app stores, by the way. Um, but you can also access a web-based version. So if you just click the web-based version, it brings you right to what you want in the browser. This is your at-home planetarium. If you visited a planetarium before, this is your, a planetarium on a flat screen, rather than a big domed projection above your head. So. In a planetarium, you'll just look around, right? Just like you would in the real sky. In this, you just pan around on the screen, and you can see in all directions, north, south, east, and west, and take a look at what's out in the sky. So it's a brilliant tool. The downloadable, downloadable version is going to have more features, but if just starting out, this is the simplest uh, version of Stellarium. It's a great way to get started with it. Um, so I'll show you the downloaded version as well. And again, it's totally free. This is for your, for your purpose. This, yes, you do set it up for your location. So if you, and also, if you wanted to, you could jump around at all different locations on Earth and see what the sky, how the sky has changed. And I think that's showing the true power of this application. Um, you can do that right from the comfort of your home. You can jump down to Brazil and see what the southern hemisphere uh, sky looks like. It's completely different from ours, because all of those objects are obstructed by the Earth. So uh, that's another fun thing to do. So I can actually show you if I pin these two here. These are your toolbars. And this is your location window. So you can just, even if you wanted to, you could just click and it changes your point of view across the Earth. Want to see what the skies look like in Antarctica? There you go. <laughs> Real easy. And then to get back, you can just go Binghamton. Maybe Binghamton. Uh-oh. I might just have to point roughly back to where we were. That's weird. Usually it does give you a list of options. Oh, there they are. Binghamton. OK. Now we're back home. So this is the sky as it is right now. We'll have some uh, twilight out there. And you can even travel through time with these, this media bar here. Or if you want more granular control, you can bring up the time window. This will change your year, month, and day. And then your hours, minutes, and seconds. So if I just click an hour ahead, skies are getting nice and dark. There's, uh, so there's about 10.30 tonight. Okay. So let's see what else. Uh, I can also bring up the constellations with this, the lines to map out the stars. This is great uh, as you start to learn the constellations. Um, you know, this, it, it really, you do have to use your imagination for these. So uh, this is very handy for connecting those dots together to build out those pictures. And as you do, you start to build up that mental map in your head of the night sky. 
There's the labels. You can also bring up the constellation artwork. See some of the mythology. And also what's neat about uh, the constellations is you are not limited to just the astronomical constellations. There are 88 constellations we use in the field of astronomy. Um, and uh, but it, it's important to know every that's just that's just the one we use in s the science of astronomy. Every culture throughout human history developed their own set of constellations, their own stories in the sky, and you could even do that too. It's like looking up at clouds, right? What does that cloud look like? Um, you could look up at the stars and come up with your own picture. Uh, there's a set um, set constellations for astronomy, but we can all tell our own stories in the sky, and humans have done so since we've looked up, pretty much from day one. So uh, you can change the, the sky cultures in here, too. There's a lot of them. Very nice. Uh, there's, and there's a whole bunch of features. There's markings. You can, like, I, one of the things I always like to add is the ecliptic. There it goes. So the ecliptic is the path of the sun through uh, out the year. Um, it's also a projection of the plane of the solar system. So all planets follow along, all main planets follow along that ecliptic. Um, the sun will and the moon does as well. So uh, that's a nice uh, reference point, imaginary line in the sky, but very handy. Turn those co the constellation artwork off for now. We'll leave the lines on as we s learn to navigate the sky a bit more. So that was a, a look at Stellarium. We're going to come back to it as we take a look at different objects throughout the, the show here. All right, jump back in here. So what comes next? We're going to see what's out there in the sky this summer now that we have some tools to work with. Uh, the first thing we're going to look at is the International Space Station. The ISS is a low Earth orbiting uh, satellite, uh, man-made satellite, uh, and it looks like this. We have a model of the ISS out in the lobby that you may have seen as you came in. This space station is the size of a football field. It has been humans uh, access into space uh, since the 90s. And uh, it, its mission will probably come to a capacity and um, you know, even recently they've had uh, leakage issues in some of the modules. So uh, it, it does eventually have to come down, but at least until then astronauts will continue to visit the ISS. And uh, let's learn a little bit more about it here. It orbits 250 miles above the Earth once every 90 minutes at a speed of 17,500 miles per hour. They're booking it up there. <laughs> what that means is that you can travel from at that speed. You can travel from New York City to Los Angeles in about nine minutes. Pretty nice flight, right? Might cause some whiplash when you accelerate to that speed, though. <laughs> so, it's uh, if I didn't mention it already, it is the, the size of a football field. It's a, a massive object out there. Most of that area is, of course, the solar panels that you see there. Sort of, they sort of look like wings on the ISS, and those center structures here is where we start to get into the living modules, where the astronauts are. It can be tight quarters, especially if it's at maximum capacity. Um, one of the neat things that uh, we've done here, I think we've even streamed it on YouTube, there's a, a great VR application that you can uh, use to explore the ISS, as if you're an astronaut floating in that low gravity environment. Um, and it, it does help you give, get a sense of the space available in there. Now in that app, you are just totally meandering around alone, but you start to add up ISS and you, re you realize, yeah, that, that can be a tight space <laughs> to live in. So, uh, yeah, uh, pretty pretty neat uh, option that's out there if you want to look into it. 
thing that's called Mission ISS. So if you've got a VR headset, try it out. <laughs> now, we get to see the ISS in the sky pretty frequently, in fact. Here are the upcoming flyovers. You may notice tonight. Tonight, hopefully just after this program ends, <laughs> uh, we can go out into the field. In fact, we're going to prioritize this. We can always come back in and answer more questions if Q&A is still going on. But uh, other, we're going to prioritize going out there, no matter what spot we are. And I'm hoping it will be perfect timing. <laughs> so at 9.25 PM, we will see the ISS fly over. It's actually going to be a pretty decent one. Maximum altitude is 28 degrees. If you stay up or even when you go home, you might look at the second pass that happens at 11 PM which is a 41 degree flyover. Again, that's higher up, right? So 41 degrees would be about the altitude of Polaris, the North Star. And uh, the max altitude for this flyover is, is lower, but certainly visible. It will, it will get above our tree line. So you can see it shown here, going from northwest to, uh, let's see, that's yeah, southwest, southeast. Yeah, we're moving towards the northeast east, or the actually don't want to do eastern sky. Um, so it, it does eventually stop right in this. You'll you'll lose it on the far side in the eastern sky uh, when it moves out of the sun's light. And we can take a look at heavensabove.com here in a second and see what that 11 p.m. flyover looks like too. Uh, but you have more opportunities as well and. What's awesome is this weekend is completely clear. Saturday, and I think Sunday as well, clear skies. So you have more opportunities. Tomorrow, 1013, you have another opportunity to see it at an 85 degree flyover. That means it's going to reach up at zenith, nearly zenith. And May 28th, almost the same times. This is cyclical, the path of the ISS around the Earth. So it's not surprising that you hit those similar times there uh, on May 28th. Not quite the same altitude for each of them, though. All right. So let's take a look uh, at Heavens Above. I think I have it loaded up already, though. So let's exit out of here. Heavens Above is just one of the many resources that you can use uh, to look up uh, satellite passes satellite flyovers. And if I zoom in here on this one, because it's a little bit, there you go. This is directly where I pulled the data from. ISS visible passes. You can see there's even more coming up over the next week. Uh, let's see. So tonight's, we had it going until about six minutes or so. We'll have that flyover. The later one is only a couple minutes, so let's take a look at that. See that? So this is the 11 p.m. flyover. And that sh might make some sense to you. Uh, early on in the evening, of course, the higher up you go, the uh, with due to parallax, right, you're rising above the horizon, you're ris and the, you'll be able to see the sun off there in the, in the distance for longer, the terminator is different for objects orbiting around the Earth. So at this later time, even for the ISS at those 250 miles up above the Earth, it is going to pass into the Earth's terminator sooner than it does at the 9.25 PM flyover. So that's why it's going to be only a couple minutes versus the almost six minutes for the uh, 9.25 flyover. So we'll look, uh, look forward to that. I'm going to back it up a page, too, because we'll eventually return to this. Uh, let's go here. So heavensabove.com is one place that you can go. Stellarium does have some of the major satellites as well. It's not as nicely laid out in data tables like you saw there. Um, but you can track satellites on uh, Stellarium and other platforms like it, too. All right, next up, 
I think it's also important, as the ISS fly flies over tonight, to know who is on board. Now, you won't see the astronauts, of course, but I always like to wave at them. It's fun. And there they are. A mix of uh, Crew Dragon astronauts um, and uh, Roscosmos and Soyuz astronauts. So uh, I'll, I, I think I can just about pronounce everyone's name here, so I'll do, I'll do my best. Uh, so uh, going left to right, we have Frank Rubio, uh, Dimitri uh, Pitalin, Sultan Al Alniadi, Woody Hoberg, Stephen Bowen, uh, Andre Fadiev, Sergei Prokopiev. <laughs> I think that, I hope I did okay. <laughs> um, so uh, that's Expedition 69. And I gotta say that I, you know they always release new patches for ex ISS expeditions. Um, I think this one's really cool. It's got like a stained glass vibe to it, um, and you can see the Earth in there, the ISS, and uh, this must be. It almost looks like a combination of the Sun, maybe a solar eclipse going on there. It, it's pretty. It's pretty neat. So. Look out for you know new patches released every every time. Um, also, you can see their their patches on here listing who, uh, what organization they're from. So um, you can see, for example, Frank Rubio has his NASA patch. So United States astronaut Dimitri has a Roscosmos patch. So Russian astronaut um, Sultan there has I think it's the United Arab uh, Emirates uh, Space Agency. And I think everyone else also is either Roscosmos or NASA. So uh, it is the International Space Station, right? Uh, you'll have uh, astronauts from all across the world going up and uh, visiting the ISS. Now, I know that you might not have great context yet of um, how confined the space can be on the ISS, but if you've seen any video from space, you, you might know. You know it's, it, even traveling to the moon, very confined spacecraft. That's a lot of people, right? That's not everyone. <laughs> There's four more people. <laughs> 11 people total on the ISS right now. <laughs> so this is uh, uh, only the second mission from Axiom, Axiom Space, a private space organization similar to SpaceX. In fact, they are launching with SpaceX rockets as of right now. And this launched May 22nd. They're not going to be up there for too long. So I'm, I'm sure uh, the other astronauts are breathing a sigh of relief you know, soon <laughs> um, to have that space opened up again. Um, but this is all uh, uh, driven by passing off the uh, space station program, eventually a new space station, to the commercial sector. As NASA starts to focus on going back to the moon and eventually to Mars, they are passing off the effectively the ISS. It won't be the ISS. It'll be a whole new space station. Um, and Axiom Space is, is helping to lead that, among many other private uh, uh, companies. So on board, you can see these fancy uh, astronaut suits, <laughs> space suits, or flight suits, really. They're, you wouldn't want to be out in. Uh, the vacuum of space with those alone necessarily, but they are really cool looking. <laughs> and they flew aboard a Crew Dragon capsule. Again, that's a space, SpaceX spacecraft. And here we have uh, Rihanna Banar, uh, that's Benari, John Schaffner, Peggy Whitson, and Ali Alcarni. Al Al and uh, now that adds a t or brings the total to 11 astronauts on the ISS at the moment. So we can wave to all 11 that are up there now. And it's kind of a cool moment for this because uh, this is a short mission, May 22nd to maybe just early June. All right, speaking of satellites, we have SpaceX Starlink. Now, to be honest, uh, this is a con somewhat controversial topic in astronomy. Uh, SpaceX Starlink is designed uh, to provide internet service. Um, as they scale up, 
ideally they wanted to provide an internet service across the world. Um, it wouldn't be a free service, it would be like any other, but that's the, the idea behind it. So think about those moments when you're traveling on the road, right? And uh, you hit those dead zones on your cell phone, you don't have access to the internet. Uh, this would potentially, a, co a constellation of satellites like this would potentially solve that problem. It comes at a cost though, a, a, an astronomical cost. So let's, let's just, for now, let's learn a little bit more about it here. Uh, right now it's a constellation of over 4,000 human-made satellites designed to provide internet service. Is launch, they launch aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 out of Cape Canaveral. So these are launches that you could see if you're, you're down there. Um, sometimes if they, you know, they're climbing in altitude, right? So we can even spot, spot them on occasion up here if their uh, trajectory is right. Uh, the next launch should happen in June. And we can look at this website, Find Starlink, for visible passes. Before we do, though, I want to show you on Heavens Above. They have a nice 3D layout of all the Starlink satellites in orbit. Here you go. That's what 4,000 satellites looks like. <laughs> That's just Starlink. So this is where the controversy comes in, right? Uh, they are, they, when they're up in their, their orbit, they're stable, they've tra uh, their trajectory is on the right course, they're not terribly visible to the human eye. Upon launching, you do see them. Uh, and you'll see them you know, s spread out in this train across the sky. I have a video I'll show you in a moment. But it's when uh, you're dealing with the science of astronomy, uh, when you're capturing data of objects, or even you're just taking images of the sky like we do here at Copernic, you start to find these trails come into the image. And there are certainly ways to process them out, but it does have an effect on data capture in the science of astronomy. So it's a, there's a lot of positive and negative to this, right? Um, it's the, the course of progress, but it's not, it doesn't come without making some potential sacrifices. Uh, I do want to mention that SpaceX has found some ways to mitigate the uh, brightness of these satellites. And that's gotten, that has improved a fair bit, knocked it down by something like 50%. Um, but yeah, even still, a camera is going to pick them up if it flies over and it's reflecting any light. So let's go back here. I want to show you what this looks like. Because I'm certainly, just from uh, uh, just viewing the night sky, from that perspective, uh, I'm certainly conflicted on them as well. But it did, it, they do look really cool. <laughs> um, we saw SpaceX Starlink pass actually on May 4th um, as well, but May 5th is when we captured the video. Um, it was, we saw it fly over here and just outside the Anderson Center at Binghamton University when we were doing sidewalk astronomy um, for the May the 4th concert down, uh, down there. But this one is from up here. Let's take a look. And, whoops, it, it didn't want to play, but then it did. Let's try again. No, I don't want to do the solar system yet. Go back. Oh, okay, this is fine. At least we're, we're far enough back now. Go one more step. And one more. There we go. So this is what, star it's, gonna, it's only like a 15 second clip, but it will loop. You can see this train. It was a train about 60 satellites or so that were launched into orbit just the day before, early morning on May 4th. And in this case, you can see it's only bright in this very select portion of the sky. And uh, it just may be the way that, that they're entering the Earth's terminator that's, that's causing that. But even then, you can still see it's reflecting up here 
and you could see those to, to the eye, or with the, with the unaided eye. So when we saw these on uh, May the 4th, we caught them through clouds. Like, it was a cloudy day. Even this is, you can see clouds here. Um, and it was, you know, once you start looking at the sky, it becomes very familiar, still very enjoyable to view and uh, explore. But then you come across something that you have to question for a moment. Because <laughs> um, you, you don't see Starlink every day. And it was, it was exciting to see it. <laughs> Right, so as they get as they get into their orbits as, and as they spread out, this, they do not stay in a train like this. They, they start to, as you saw, it was kind of like a grid setup that they have um, in that 3D view we were looking at. Um, but more than that, uh, as they've ad adapted, um, as, and as astronomers have complained about them, uh, it's how they're uh, coding these spacecraft and how they orient them in their orbit that starts to bring knock down that brightness. So this is the brightest they can be. And this is only early on. Now these satellites are at, not visible to the eye. Um, the brightest ones might be a magnitude 4 or 5, so maybe a couple of them are. But ultimately, they get them outside the range of um, naked eye viewing. So that's what Starlink looks like. And uh, like I said, the, we won't be able to see that tonight in this for, in this, to this degree. Uh, we will possibly see it again as they launch the next mission in June, probably early June. We'll see that. So be on the lookout. They launch right out of Cape Canaveral, and um, they are often uh, visible in this train. And if I can direct you to, let's go back here to find Starlink. Yeah, these people are pretty uh, helpful at notifying you of the next time you might spot it. Um, they give you a notification of when you might next find it, because right now everything is, is not bright enough to, to really see it. So they say that uh, next Starlink launch is planned in the next few weeks. I don't know exactly when this notification came out. I've been hearing early June for the next launch. So. We'll look forward to that, but if you do click off this notification, you get ways to search for when they'll be visible. Here's United States, Vestal, New York. Find visible times. And they will give you estimates of when you can see them. Um, and it'll tell you whether it's dim. So you see here there's some that are at a magnitude of 5, 6.5. Um, so you're going to be hard pressed to spot those. The ISS is at its brightest. Um, if we go back to heavens above, tonight will be a, a pretty bright flyover. It's in the negative range. So tonight's is negative 2. Even if you stay up later at 11, it's neg almost negative 3. You can see these are almost negative 4. Those are approaching uh, the brightness of Venus. So that's really bright. I would say that when we saw the video here, they were maybe pushing the brightness of, of Vega, you know, in that zero range. Um, the day before, I would say it was more pushing brightness of, of Sirius, and just a, one of the brightest stars. But it is the brightest star in the sky that we can see up here in the northern hemisphere. So that's that's what they'll look like at their brightest. So maybe something to look for. It is it is neat to see. All right. Now we're getting beyond the Earth's orbit, venturing into the solar system. What can we see in the summer? Well, there's something we can see year-round. The sun. Raise your hand if you saw the sun in our astro scan today, this year. Some of you did, especially the, 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 uh, those that maybe arrived earlier got to see it because it was setting, right? In fact, uh, because of the time of year, we are adjusting our uh, Opening time starting next week uh, to uh, doors open at 8 and presentation start at 8.30 because it's so bright out. Um, so, uh, yeah, th this is the sun as it was today. And uh, the sun's going to be more and more interesting to look at as we head towards 2024 and 2025. I mean, it's even interesting today to look at because of all those sunspots. Lots to see. 
Um, there's that nice archipelago, a couple of them, this massive sun sunspot that's way larger than the Earth. So, uh, and also looking even ahead this year, there's an annular solar eclipse coming up too. Um, so it's a, and in 2024 in April, there'll be the, the near total eclipse here and a total eclipse up in northern New York um, to, to spot as well. So we're heading to the year of the sun. Um, the sun's very getting very active, lots to see. Um, but uh, one word of caution on this is do not view the sun without the right equipment. And uh, frankly, if you're concerned at all, you have any doubt that you're not going to observe it right, just don't do it. Come to a place like Copernic, um, seek out uh, your uh, neighborhood astronomer, anything like that, uh, that will help you get started on, on viewing it. Um, you can't use a regular pair of binoculars. I mean, a lot of this is common sense, of course, but um, telescopes, no, just regular telescopes. You need filters. Uh, you need those solar glasses that you may have used in the eclipse back in uh, 2017, and we'll use them again. But uh, also, I want to show you an example. I'll turn this light on here. So just uh, a couple days ago, <laughs> um, we were looking at the sun uh, with our 6-inch telescope. We have a fil special filter um, that no knocks out about 90% of the light, so it's safe for viewing. Um, we do not have a filter for the uh, finder scope. We ultimately don't use the finder scope for finding the sun itself. We'll just end up using our, our filter system uh, to, to locate it. But that finder scope should have two caps on it, and it didn't. The top cap was off. The bottom cap was on. And this is what happened to the bottom cap. I'll come around the room and show you. So without that top cap, this bottom cap experienced the full power of the sun, <laughs> translated through that small finder scope. And that's what can happen to your eye. <laughs> If I could jump in here, um, Jeremy had also talked about this, you know, those solar eclipse glasses. Um, here's a pair of solar eclipse glasses, and uh, somebody had actually given these, these to us uh, in this particular condition. What they, this person did was, well, I've got these solar eclipse glasses. I'll put them on. And now I take my binoculars. I get a good look at the, and what you saw to that that uh, lens cap, th that happened to the these. Uh, uh, there's a uh, those two holes. Fortunately for the gentleman, uh, it just burned about you know a part of his cheek. So this is what happens <laughs> when you don't use something correctly. So don't do this, <laughs> in a word or in, in a phrase. Gone. Thanks, so yeah, Jeremy. if you're worried about the sun at all, you know, just uh, if you're worried, you don't have the right equipment to view it. You can always go online and check out what the sun's doing that day. And like I said, seek out your local resources um, to view it directly. Um, it is really interesting uh, to observe uh, day to day. It will change its surface. Um, the sun does rotate. And it's going to be very dynamic. Um, as we reach solar maximum, the sun can hit peaks of up to 150 sunspots at a time. Uh, so. We'll, we'll look forward to that. And it's also neat that it's happening right around a solar eclipse. So not only do we get to see the eclipse play out, we'll get to see the dynamics of the sun that day as well. So the sun is all, always there to, to view. Um, and I'm glad some of you got to check it out uh, today. Um, let me turn this light right here off here, this one. All right, so next up. We have the moon. This is also an object that you can regularly see. Um, and we go through one lunar cycle every 29 and a half days. That means the moon goes through all of its phases from new moon to full moon and back to new moon. So uh, this here is a, a gibbous. And uh, 
Arguably, the best time to view the moon is when it's in, in one of these phases, crescent, gibbous. Uh, when you can see the terminator, that's when you get some really nice crisp detail from the craters. You get that contrast, those shadows. So that is uh, an uh, ideal time. Nice part with the moon, it is a bright object, but you can observe it any way you want. Uh, you can una use the unaided eye, binoculars, telescopes, cameras. Use whatever tool you have available, and uh, you you can, uh, of course, the more powerful <laughs> the, the device, um, the more you'll see those nice nice craters up close. And you get, get to some pretty high resolutions, because, of course, it's our nearest celestial neighbor. So uh, lots of, what, one, I guess, word of caution on this, too. Um, you may, when viewing, if you don't have a moon filter, you may want to select an uh, eye for lunar viewing and an eye for just navigating around your scope and it, here at Copernic around the observatory. Because the moon is bright, it will overexpose your eye. Um, and you won't be able to see in the dark all that well. All right, so the moon's a good one. We also have some planets here in the early, uh, heading into the early summer, and they're out now as well um, in the late spring. So any ideas as to what those are? Venus and Mars. So Venus there is uh, a crescent. And even when it's in phase like that, it has a thin crescent, it's still incredibly bright. Um, honestly, that's among one of the most interesting things to see with Venus uh, is, is when it's in phase. Um, you, you'll get some color. It's a, a kind of a off-white. Um, but other, otherwise, it's just a completely clouded planet. I mean, I always say, like, think about if uh, Binghamton was a planet. There you go. Although not tonight. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, just 100% uh, cloud coverage all the time, and those clouds are very reflective. So it ends up being very bright on our sky, but not a lot to see. Um, you can't really, with visible light, you're not piercing through those clouds. Co uh, you can compare that to Mars here. And these pictures were taken at Copernic. Um, so through our, this was through our six inch here. And if I recall, this one was uh, taken th with a smartphone through the 20 inch telescope when it was visual. So just through an eyepiece. Um, so this was through our, one of our smaller scope uh, with a camera uh, designed for um, planetary imaging. That, that sensor on the camera is fairly low resolution. So that's why this is pretty pixelated. Um, but you can see some of the features, like up here, one of the, the darker regions on, on uh, Mars. This is Sirtis Major. Down here is the South Pole of Mars. You can see that white. And uh, you might even get a touch of the North Pole up here as well. This was taken a few years back, not during the most recent uh, close approach of Mars. I think that was uh, the, a couple, couple years before that. So uh, those are the two planets we can see. We are drifting away from Mars right now, so um, and it's a half the size of the Earth, and it's uh, pretty far away from us. So you really can't uh, get too much detail at the moment. It's really just on that close approach in the months before and after, uh, where you can really make out some some of those features with the eye. Um, so they're they're there though, and you can, for example, with Mars, you'll notice the color of is noticeably red to the unaided eye and through a telescope as well. Um, and if those polar ice caps are, are still as big as they were, then those might be visible too. OK, perfect. So all right, so we might, we might see, see some of those features there. Um, notice, uh, now of course, this could just be due to to, to, to the timing of the year, right, or when the image was taken. But I did this intentionally. Venus is in phase. Mars is not. The inner planets will move through the phases, just like the moon. Now, the inner, inner planets meaning from our perspective here on Earth. So Venus and Mercury will go through phases. As you look to the outer planets, you'll occasionally get some more gibbous looks at Mars, but uh, Beyond, even once you reach beyond Mars, you're just going to be seeing the full uh, disk of those planetary objects. So 
Yeah, something interesting to see with Venus and Mercury, for sure. And if you ever visit Mars, you'll see Earth go through its phases. <laughs> All right, late summer planets. We'll lose Mars and Venus as we head into the late summer, but we will gain Jupiter and Saturn. Saturn first, Jupiter as we really push into late summer. We're talking September for that one at a convenient evening hour. If you stay up late, you'll see them, but um, I'm thinking more like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. So uh, again, these were also taken through our 6-inch telescope uh, with the same camera system. And uh, some of the features that you can spot with your eye certainly are the great red spot on Jupiter. Uh, here's you have, see the rings of Saturn, the Cassini division in the rings. You'll also see some of the layering on Saturn as well. That is very noticeable on Jupiter, those equatorial gas bands and some of the texture that comes with them. And you also with Jupiter, you may notice there's this dark spot here. Uh, that dark spot is not on the is not from the surface. Those hydrogen clouds, it's being projected. It's a shadow from this right here. If you can just see kind of a faint circular shape there, that is, uh, if I recall, that is Io, the moon of Io, projecting its shadow onto the surface of Jupiter. So you can see transit events like this too. Not just the shadow, but also the moon transiting across the planet. So uh, that's also pretty neat to see. Jupiter can show a lot of detail. And even in one night, you will notice the rotation, the revolution of those closer moons around uh, Jupiter itself. Jupiter also has a rotational period of nine hours. So if you are watching it long enough, or even if you just try and take a time lapse with your camera, uh, you can uh, see the rotation of Jupiter. It's really quick. For such a big planet, it's got really short days. All right, so uh, those are a couple of our late summer planets. Now I want to show you these in Stellarium. Let's see how we're doing on time. Ooh, got to get moving here a little bit. OK, all right. So uh, let's just quickly show you Venus and Mars, where they are. You can see they're starting to, uh, oh, actually, we go back to current time. They're up here near Venus is in Gemini, and Mars is he heading towards Cancer there in the western sky. So they're setting in the west following the sun. The moon's trailing them. The moon, by the way, if I press the space bar and zoom in, you can do that with the planets too. I, hear, I heard some oohs and ahs. <laughs> So uh, you can see that we're, we're approaching that first quarter moon. And then if we start traveling through time here, I'm just going to jump up to 10 PM. There we go. We're August 26. We'll even back up a month. And you see on July 26, that around 10 PM, you have Saturn just rising in the eastern sky. If you go a couple hours ahead, climbs up higher and higher. And then if you stay up really late on January 27th, you'll see Jupiter follow. If we skip a month ahead of this, though, into August, moving further into the summer, things are much farther along at 1 o'clock in the morning. So we can even backtrack this. Now we're August 26th at 11 PM. Jupiter's just rising. Saturn's pretty far along. Uh, so this will continue to progress. They'll rise earlier and earlier in the evening uh, as we head into the summer and then into the fall. So some really good planets coming up in, in late summer that have a lot of detail to observe. All right, jump back in here. Also in our solar system coming up is the Perseid meteor shower. This has a predicted peak of August 13th. Now, uh, we often do run programs for the Perseid meteor shower. Um, sometimes we, we open it up to m multiple days. Um, and given that these Perseids will be, 
the moon won't be a problem for them because with meteor showers, the moon does uh, cause some trouble with the dimmer meteors. You won't be able to see them. Uh, but this is going to be a waning crescent moon, which is great. So ideally with meteor showers, you, you want to be in the early morning hours to observe them, um, especially for this one with uh, Perseus. Perseus, that's where it gets its name. They will appear to originate from the constellation Perseus. Uh, and Perseus doesn't rise until uh, later hours in that evening. You're talking midnight, it'll start climbing up higher and higher in the sky, and that will give you more of an opportunity to see a lot of those meteors. So, uh, but, you know, you can still see some of them in the, in the evening hours, and uh, we will be open if the, the skies allow, so uh, you can visit us again. This was a Perseid meteor flying over the Andromeda galaxy. See that here? I should point that out with the mouse. Um, so, yep, here we go. This is the Andromeda galaxy here, and this is a Perseid meteor. Perseid meteors are often green in color. Uh, so, this definitely you just observe with the unaided eye. Telescopes won't do you any good. You need a wide field, and the best wide field you can use are your eyes looking up at the sky. If you're fighting clouds, just look wherever is clear. That'll give you your best opportunity to spot some. All right, so Perseid meteor shower is coming soon. Um, this is one of my favorite meteor showers. You get a lot of meteors. Um, with the moon not being an issue, you'll get even more. And uh, it's just really fun to watch. Uh, I don't think we quite have time for that, so we'll skip it. You can find Perseid meteor showers in Solarium, just like I've shown you navigating um, as we have. The Milky Way is another object that is great for summertime viewing. This was the Milky Way at Copernic a, a few years ago, though even this summer it'll look the same. Um, the best time to view the Milky Way is in the summertime for us here uh, because we get to see the galactic center, the heart of the Milky Way, uh, where you have this huge congestion of stars and uh, starlight. So you're looking right into the core here of our galaxy. And even in this image, this is taken with a camera, so your eye will not pick up this kind of light. Uh, it, you'll see the Milky Way, but it won't be as bright as you see here. Um, but you get clusters. You get even traces of nebula in this wide field image. In this one, we even caught, this is probably a satellite up here. This is most likely a, me a meteor streak through the image. So really nice there. Milky Way is a good summer object. Deep sky objects, too. Uh, these are in the core of the Milky Way, um, just above it, near Cassiopeia. <coughs> and uh, on the left here, you have a wide field capture of multiple nebula, the Trifid M20. That's its Messier catalog number. Trifid Nebula and the Lagoon Nebula, both star-forming regions out there in the universe. Then you have a couple of star clusters as well. Really nice wide field that captures multiple objects. Here's a narrower, narrower field image of the Trifid Nebula. Um, I got to say this is among one of my favorite objects. There's just a lot going on. You have actual hydrogen emission. This is that pink color here. And then the blue color is your uh, stellar reflectance. So just from the stars in that region reflecting off the clouds, the hydrogen clouds. And some amazing structures of those dark nebula through there. So uh, Trifid Nebula is a nice one to see. Both of those visible through binoculars. Dumbbell Nebula, M27. Do you see the dumbbell? <laughs> uh, this is a planetary nebula. So similar, we, when we look at these, we're seeing uh, the stellar life cycle in action. Whereas those previous nebula were star uh, forming, this is a, uh, a, a star that has died. It has expanded its outer layers, spreading those off into space, and all that's left at the center is that white dwarf. Uh, you can see it right there. So dumbbell nebula. Pinwheel ga Galaxy. Raise your hand if you've heard about the Pinwheel Galaxy in the news. 
I see some hands going up. Very good. Pinwheel Galaxy M101. This is a full galaxy outside of our Milky Way. You can see its galactic center here. We're looking at its face. So uh, we're not looking at it from the edge. It's just a really nice uh, front-facing galaxy. And uh, right now, if you've uh, been uh, watching the news, it's not pictured in this image. This was from a few years back. But it's just about right here where there is a supernova that just happened. And it is uh, bright enough to be visible to the eye. Um, not in, you need, sorry, I should preface that. You need to look through a telescope, of course. But you don't need a camera to capture it. You can see it. All right. Ten minutes left here. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll actually, in about five minutes, we'll make sure we go, go out to, to look at the ISS. Um, here's the Andromeda Galaxy again. The Andromeda Galaxy is visible to the unaided eye. And that's just above our, the front of Copernic. And again, I'm going to skip the Stellarium part. Again, you just, there's a search function in Stellarium. You can just search for it right in there and uh, explore. All right, so finally, just some tools that you can use when exploring the sky. Stellarium is one. There's the website again, stellarium.org, stellarium.org. And uh, again, fantastic tool for uh, your planetarium at home. I have some mobile applications too. Stellarium is on there. But uh, Starwalk and Sky Guide, those are two good introductory level uh, planetariums on your phone. And those even use the gyroscope so you can pan around uh, the sky. And it uses your compass to sync, sync things up. If you want a more advanced application, Sky Safari is the way to go. With that one, you can even sync it to your telescope and use it to operate the scope. That is a paid application, but very handy. And lastly, I always uh, like to inform you that if, if you have a smartphone, there's a lot of astrophotography that you can do. Um, with night mode, um, some smartphones have really uh, advanced telephoto lenses on them now that can do some decent captures of the moon. There's a lot that you can do with your smartphone, and I always like to share my most recent photos that I've just captured out and about. I'm not carrying my whole astrophotography rig or real, you know, nice uh, mirrorless camera around all the time, S especially when I go on vacation. I'm not doing it. <laughs> um, so it's uh, too heavy. My smartphone's the way to go. And I always like to, when, when I go on vacation, I, I like to bring astronomy into it sometimes. So I've got a couple of examples for that. Um, I just, uh, my partner and I just came back from Disney. So there's one. <laughs> Can you see Venus in there? <laughs> so Venus is right up at the top. Would you believe it? If you visit Batu, you can see Venus. <laughs> um, and then also this here, I think this was just outside the Tiki room or something. I don't know. But um, you can see Venus down here. Oh, actually, I have these all labeled. Mars, Pollux, Castor, Venus. Again, all just taken on a smartphone with that night mode. It does a great job of taking multiple photos, stacking them together, together and spitting out an image that handles multiple exposures, those to the night sky and those to the brighter objects in the foreground. So explore. Use that. Tell a story in the sky. There's so much value in doing that, and it's so accessible to do. Um, and this might be the first time in a while that this has worked. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, clear skies. I think we're going to go out. I apologize. We don't uh, quite have time for like a full Q&A session in here. If you have questions after the ISS pass, I will be back in to help answer those. And uh, as far as the stream goes, if you have questions, we'll leave the stream running, and I'll come back in and answer those too. Um, right. So we'll go check out the ISS. What we'll do Thank here you. is we'll walk out the main door and then take a right.